Ask any gamer what one of the worst things about gaming is, and they won't tell you cancelled games. But it's true. I mean, how many times have you tasted that bitter pill of disappointment from a hype's game you've so been looking forward to suddenly to get the axe? It's not nice, is it? No. Unfortunately, the reasons of cancellation can't all be down to quality issues, company restructuring, having Peter Molyneux on the team, and budgetary constraints. Every now and then, something will go wrong and they'll get the chop for the most hilariously idiotic reasons possible. But, hello you! I'm Guru Larry, and this is Fact Hunt. Four games cancelled for stupid reasons. Why four? Because I couldn't find a fifth one. I'm going to be cruel and start with a game that everybody wants, but sadly, we'll probably never get. Time Splitters 4. The series by ex-Rare devs that felt more of a sequel to Goldeneye than even Perfect Dark did. But, be honest, when people talk about Time Splitters, they really mean Time Splitters 2. That frozen dam level at the beginning is almost iconic as a silent cartographer in Halo, Wake Island in Battlefield, and the Era 37 screen on Diablo 3. For those of you who have never heard of Time Splitters before, the series is about a band of warriors throughout history who have to hunt down the mysterious artifacts in each period before an evil race known as the Time Splitters can use it to ruin time quicker than Grey's Sports Almanac on a free Kindle book day. So essentially, Assassin's Creed totally ripped their story off. Yeah. Time Splitters was addictive, even more so with its fantastic four player split screen multiplayer and later on online multiplayer in Future Perfect. It introduced zombie horde mode long before Call of Duty ever did, and the series even lets you play as a shotgun toting monkey, which makes that the ultimate in awesomeness in anyone's book. But this, unfortunately, is where the story sours. Free Radical Design had a bit of a bumpy road after developing Future Perfect. It did sell as well as they initially hoped, and their next title was the abysmal Halo wannabe Haze. Cue that really old footage of Wes and I fighting an invisible tank. Okay, but look at this. How many games do you get to see an invisible jeep flying past you? Look at that. Lovely. I love that clip. Soon after, they were bought by Crytek and made the multiplayer sections to Crisis 2 and Crisis 3. But in all that time, they always had in the back of their minds, we've got to do it. Let's make a fourth time splitters. And for a brief moment, that's what looked like was going to happen. But no. So, what was the stupid reason such a highly demanded cult video game sequel got the axe? Quality assurance? Lack of demand? Nope. Marketing couldn't decide what character to put on a box art. Now this sounds even more stupid when you factor in that sequels nearly always market themselves from their reputation, nostalgia and word of mouth. But what Crytek's marketing really meant was, from a series with dozens of characters, not one of them was iconic enough to entice new players into the franchise. Yes, Halo was Master Chief, and Call of Duty as... So you can see where they're coming from. But Crytek cancelled an entire game solely on not having a marketable main character to slap on a box in their eyes. Despite the fact Future Perfect had already done that. Yeah! Creepy title aside, many of you have probably never heard of Liquid Kids. That's probably because it was a rather obtuse Tato Arcade game that only ever saw the light of day on the PC Engine and Sega Saturn in Japan. But Liquid Kids stars a kidnapped girlfriend rescuing, water bubble blowing, anthropomorphic platypus who is incorrectly referred to as a hippo in a game, because his name is Hippopo for some reason. And I've just broke my brain describing that. <laughs> Good old early 90s video game development. Though Liquid Kid's biggest claim to fame is that it's a sort of sequel to The New Zealand Story, one of the few pre-Sonic animal mascot success stories. That probably doesn't really mean much to anyone outside of Europe, well, outside the UK and who grew up in the 1980s, come to think of it, but the New Zealand story was huge here for some reason. Like, Super Mario 3 big. Heck, you'd be a gay lord of Joey Deacon proportions at school if you didn't own it at the time, as pretty much everyone had a copy. 
It was on every system imaginable, and was even bundled with a couple to boot. Now, the home ports of the New Zealand story were developed by everyone's favourite British licensee, Ocean Software. So when Ocean learned that Taito were working on a sequel, not sequel follow-up, they jumped at the chance of nomming that lucrative copyright cake. So they threw their entire French subsidiary into full steam making ports, and a year later, we were bestowed the sequential to one of the biggest video games out there. Except, that never happened. So what was the stupid reason for the game being cancelled? Well, Ocean France developed and finished the entire game in less than 10 months. And in all that time, not a single person checked to see if they actually secured the rights to make it in the first place. <laughs> yep, it's a license without a license. Of course, Ocean could have obtained the license from Taito. After all, they were best buddies, so Taito would have obviously have said yes to the deal. But more lack of communications meant that Ocean France had only developed an Amiga port. And as insane as it was making AAA Amiga games at that time anyway, they not only axed the game, but shut down Ocean France as well. The Amiga port was eventually leaked onto the interwebs in 2003, completing all its English glory. But it's such a shame it never saw the light of day in the West, as it's a pretty fun platformer. But we can all thank Ocean for counting their eggs before they've hatched. You know, as platypuses lay eggs. Huh? <laughs> yeah, get it? I'll get my coat. Oh, Larry, you've already done Streets of Rage 4 and your sequel is down. I know! But don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with a serious history again. You can watch that video if you want to know all that stuff. Shameless plug intended. But what I'm here to talk about specifically is Sega's own attempt at a fourth game on the Dreamcast. To even Sega themselves having a stab at the sequel for the Dreamcast to no avail. Yeah, that bit. Now, after the complete cluster fudge that was a Saturn, Sega tried a last ditch attempt to reconnect with its fans again by releasing sequels to a number of its 16-bit titles on the Dreamcast. Sounds like a great plan, but when you see the planned list was Echo the Dolphin, Sonic Adventure, rent a hero Toe Jam and L3, Shikan the Forever Man 2, and of course Streets of Rage 4, you can see Sega dived headfirst into development hell, with only Sonic and Echo coming out completely unscathed. But we're here to talk about Streets of Rage 4, again, and more so, why it was cancelled. Well, Bernie Stolar cancelled it, as he has never heard of Streets of Rage before. I'll let that sink in for a minute. The president of Sega of America, the man who runs the company, actually cancelled the sequel to one of 90's most beloved franchises simply because he had no idea that Sega released three previous games in the series. Now you would have thought having a number 4 at the end of the title would have given away SOME indication Sega may have had a history of the series, but this is a bozo who put the nail in the Sega Saturn's coffin by uttering the line, the Saturn is not our future, in an interview two years after its release. There's an old saying in business, don't throw up the baby with the bathwater, which essentially means check to see if there's anything successful there before getting rid of everything. But Mr Stolo has obviously never heard of this saying before, as he threw half the bloody bathroom out of it too. So I've saved the best, or rather, worst, until last, with Parasol Stars, Taito's cancelled arcade sequel to Rainbow Islands, which, amazingly, ended up getting ports for anyway. But for those of you who have never heard of Parasol Stars before, the game once again stars the humanoid forms of Bub and Bob from Bubble Bubble, whom have grown tired of shooting rainbows out of their crotch, yes I know I've used that joke before, and have now resorted to twatting their enemies with an umbrella instead. And yes, it is an umbrella and not a parasol, as they use it to protect themselves from water with them. Parasols only protect you from the sun. Yes, you could technically use an umbrella as a parasol, but stop being so bloody pedantic in my factual-based video game features, okay? Parasol Stars was an okay game, kind of a step back from Rainbow Islands in my opinion, as it was more in line with Bubble Bubble's more archaic gameplay than anything else. But at least they didn't steal the music to Somewhere Over the Rainbow this time. No, they stole the Lombarda instead. 
But this isn't the only theft in this story. No. The Commodore 64 port of Parasol Stars was cancelled due to the developer's computer being nicked in a burglary. Or that's what Ocean Software, the publisher, would have you believe in their story. That's right, they lied to us. I know, right? A publisher telling porkies? Pfft, that could never happen. But it's a bit of a white lie, really. Well, maybe grey. Now, aside from the Turbo Graphics version, all home system ports of the game were once again handled by our old Mancurian chums at Ocean Software. In fact, it was to be their final Commodore 64 game. Well, 8 bit game in general, come to think of it. Ocean were winding up production of 8 bit games, so rather than hire a massive team to work on a game, it was outsourced to a single freelancer to save money. Unfortunately, this programmer, whom I won't name as I'm not a dick, was going through a bit of a rough patch in his married life. He was constantly arguing with his wife about her alcoholism and the fact she was seeing her ex-husband behind his back. Yeah, pretty heavy stuff. Anyhow, in a spate of drunken rage and leaving him forever, she smashed up all of his work equipment, hardware and data discs, effectively ruining months of his work and completely destroying the game. Now, you're probably asking, why didn't he make backups? The thing is, he did, but she unfortunately knew about them too. In fact, the only thing that he had remaining was a three month old pitch he had submitted to Ocean to get the job in the first place, and that was only because he left it in his briefcase and had completely forgotten about it. He tried to ask Ocean for an extension to the contract to reclaim the lost work, but as they were winding up publishing on the older systems anyway, they decided to cancel it outright despite extensively advertising for it. So, out of respect for the developer's personal life, they fabricated a story to the press that he had been burgled. The downside to this white lie is hardcore gamers spent decades scouring the wild through car boot sales, jumble sales, and eventually eBay, looking for this legendary, elusive stolen Commodore 64 that contained the lost code for Paracel Stars, only to discover that it never even existed. So the Commodore 64 version of Parasol Stars was cancelled thanks to a violent, cheating alcoholic. Of course she deeply regretted her actions years later, but you couldn't make this up, could you? Hello again, peoples. Thanks again for watching this new episode of Fact Hunt, and more so, thank you for the kind comments about the previous episode. I never expected anything like it. But as always, be sure to subscribe to me to be first to know when future episodes are available, and check out some of my previous shows in the meantime. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon page, as it's really helping investing in all this original research. But thanks again, and I'll be seeing you next time.